Good day, everybody, and welcome to the symposium delivering on climate and biodiversity targets through better fisheries management. We are just getting started and allowing people to enter the webinar. So we'll just wait one or two more minutes until we have everyone in the virtual room with us. Thanks for joining. Nice to see that we have some uh, people with us today who also joined yesterday. So I'll, I'll just get started because um, it's the perfect time. Um, I'm Rebecca Hubbard, Program Director with Our Fish and the moderator for this webinar, which is the second of four events this week where we are presenting and discussing pioneering science that explores how ending overfishing is crucial to delivering action against the biodiversity and climate emergency. It's lovely to see people joining from all over Europe and I, I believe the world again today. With this symposium, we aim to demonstrate with the help of an impressive global group of scientists and economists, how ending overfishing mitigates climate change, improves adaptation and restores ocean health and in doing so it provides huge benefits for people too. Before we get started, we'll just run through some webinar house rules. Um, I'm pretty sure you're probably all familiar with them after the Zoom uh, virtual room that we've all entered for the last 12 months. But in terms of the rules, we have an amazing team of interpreters with us again today. So if you would like to listen to the webinar, you can do so in French, Spanish, German, or English. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little world icon. Just click on that. It says interpretation and choose the channel which you would like to listen to. Um, if you could move the slide, please, to the rules. Thanks, Mike. So, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Uh, try to keep the chat box for just general comments or, or other logistical questions. But your questions to the presenters, please put into the Q&A and preferably indicate who you, would, who you are addressing. We will try to have a Q&A session at the end. But for those of you who joined us yesterday, the presentations were so um, interesting and thorough that we didn't actually get to have a, a, a verbal Q&A. So just in case that happens, we will do the same thing as yesterday where we will answer some questions in that Q&A chat box. So definitely please use that. And if you like someone else's question, you can vote it up. Um, and we are recording again. So please be polite and respectful and um, Enjoy. So as, a, as we did yesterday, we'll just run a short poll now and again at the end of the webinar to understand more about who all of you are that have joined us. So you should see that poll pop up on your screen now. Um, and I'll just give you a bit of the context for this, this webinar. So um, really, uh, we live on planet ocean. Uh, the planet should be called ocean, not earth, because not only does it cover 70% of the surface, but it supports all life, even if you live in a desert and have never been to the sea. So we need the ocean for the air we breathe, water, food, and a safe functioning climate. But as the Secretary General of the UN, Antonio Guterres says, humans have been waging war on nature and the ocean and restoring its ability to regulate the climate is a defining challenge. Making peace 
with nature and protecting our planet is the only way we'll be able to ensure a sustainable future for humanity. This will require fishing in a more peaceful and non-destructive way. So just over one year ago, the Owlfish team started talking to some scientists about how we could further investigate the ways that the ocean and fish provide solutions to climate change instead of just being a victim of climate change. We've had a great time working with an incredible group of scientists from across the globe, all via Zoom. It started just moments before COVID lockdown. And we found the results are often quite surprising. The possibilities for restoring our relationship with nature and halting climate chaos through better fisheries management are actually really exciting. For decision makers in the EU and across the world, there is a unique opportunity to turn this new ocean research into decisive action that heals the war on nature and delivers on climate commitments. So instead of just having all of these new promises um, from leaders, we can actually turn some of those promises and words into actions. The papers presented here uh, in the webinar are part of a theme series that will be published in Frontiers in Marine Science and are free to access. And this webinar is the second in a four part series. But please note that if you haven't registered for the other events, you do need to register uh, for all of the events separately. So please do that at climateocean.com. Today's event will be recorded, as I said, and this record, the recordings and the presentations will also be made available afterwards um, at climateocean.com, just as the recordings and presentations from yesterday's webinar are now available at the website. Um, and to get into today's session, today we really have a special focus on small scale fisheries, ecosystem interactions, carbon sequestration of fish and fisheries and adaptation. Sorry about that, <laughs> something happened on my screen. Um, so today we have another amazing lineup of scientists to share all of this with us. We have four presentations of 15 minutes each and then a Q&A session, as I said. Um, please pop those questions into the box as we go. First up, we have Erica M. Ferre, who will be presenting the theory and empirics suggest that an end to overfishing will help small scale fisheries flourish in a warmer world. Erica is a PhD candidate and NSF graduate student researcher at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, UC San Diego, and she was a co-presenter at our opening event yesterday. Erica's research focuses on the relationships among people, marine ecosystems, conservation policy and global change. Her work is underlain by the idea that all living things are connected and thus environmental health and the success of human societies need to be understood as one and the same. Erica has a bachelor in marine biology where she studied ocean acidification and is conducting doctoral research on small scale fisheries, near shore ecology and climate change in Northwest Mexico, which is uh, part of the focus of her presentation today. So with that, I'll hand it to you, Erica. Thanks everyone for joining. Thanks, Rebecca. And I am requesting remote control. Wonderful, just wanna test that everything's working on my end. Okay, it's a little spotty, but Thanks everyone for being here. As Rebecca said, I'm a graduate student at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, uh, working under the mentorship of Dr. Octavio Burto, who, along with other colleagues from Scripps Gulf of California Marine Program, has helped support the work that I'll present today. A quick note about the order of the talk. The for first portion of my title notes that I'll touch on both theory and empirics. I'll lead with the empirics specific to my research in Northwest Mexico, and then end with some of the theory behind this idea that ending overfishing is good for all parties. As many of you learned yesterday, this theory is well substantiated and increasingly accepted. Um, just to note that we are working with slide formats from all over the world. So uh, my 
below bar here that would normally kind of tell you where you are in the sequence of the talk is a little bit finicky, um, but you know, bear with me. So here I go. Uh, at this point, some of you all may be familiar with this infographic where various themes explored throughout the symposium are displayed. The bulk of my talk will focus on the greenhouse gas emissions stemming from fishing activities conducted in Mexico's Gulf of California region. We live in a time of tremendous change. To describe climate change as an emergency is by no means hyperbolic. Indeed, according to a special report produced by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, under the current version of countries' pledges to the Paris Agreement, we're on track for 2.9 to 3.4 degrees Celsius warming by the end of the century. Simultaneously, we're confronted with the question of how best to feed an expanding human population and on a planet where climate change already threatens food security. Food accounts for about one third of all anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions, including carbon dioxide, as well as other heat trapping gases such as methane, nitrous oxide, et cetera. And while some studies have pointed to seafood as a source of low carbon protein, very few include information on the contributions of small scale fisheries. This is at odds with the tremendous role that small scale fisheries play in contributing to food security and livelihoods around the world. Many people don't know this, but small scale fisheries or SSFs contribute roughly one half of all seafood landed for direct consumption. So in addition to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, climate action requires carbon accounting and an understanding of what we're doing right versus wrong. What sorts of food policies, infrastructure, uh, human behaviors, et cetera, help contribute to stemming climate change? To mitigate the knowledge gap in our understanding of small-scale fisheries footprint, my colleagues and I have been able to utilize data generated by long-term monitoring efforts in the seas of Northwest Mexico surrounding the Gulf of California. So for those of you who are familiar with the geog geography of North America, the Baja California Peninsula sits just below California uh, and sandwiches the Gulf of California uh, inland sea uh, between the Baja California Peninsula and the Sonoran mainland of Mexico. Fisheries in the region are highly productive, contributing over half of biomass landed by all SSFs in Mexico's coastal states. The work I'm about to share with you has been made possible by the collaborative efforts of my colleagues with the Gulf of California Marine Program, shown here, uh, and co the community members and fishers that they work with. As part of this program, we've collected novel tracking data and traditional fisheries logbook data for nearly 10 years. Using these data for the first chapter of my thesis, I explored the emission intensity estimates associated with seven types of seafood products in the region, demersal mollusks, large pelagics, non-resident demersal fish, resident demersal fish, crustaceans, small pelagic fish, and shrimp. In this figure, adapted from work in press in the journal Fisheries, I've listed each class of organisms on the left vertical axis and emission intensity per trip on the horizontal axis. The information presented here represents data from over 4,500 individual fishing trips, where mean for each class is denoted by a blue diamond. On the right-hand vertical axis, I've listed emission intensity estimates for each type of seafood with the emission estimate for protein listed in parentheses. Now this number helps us compare protein from seafood to other types of protein ranging from vegetal to uh, protein from cattle, for example. And what we find, if my slide will advance, is that certain taxa of fish in Mexico offer low carbon seafood option, while others like shrimp do not. Indeed, protein from demersal mollusks at the top of this graph here is on par with protein from a plant-based diet, whereas protein from shrimp shares a similar protein with that of ruminant herbivores, including cows, sheep, and goat. But 
what explains the wide variability in these, these estimates? For example, shrimp landed had a wide range of carbon footprint from roughly two kilograms of carbon dioxide to over a thousand kilograms of carbon dioxide per kilogram of wet weight. Perhaps unsurprisingly, what I found is that the trips with very high emission intensity estimates were those where a very small amount of seafood was landed. Come on, slide. Okay, great. Uh, so I wondered, how does emission intensity relate to fishing pressure? Is the variability we saw on the previous slide related to overfishing, perhaps? I hypothesized that emission intensity is directly related to fishing status, including overfishing. One way to test this idea is to look at the fishing footprint of one location where fishing pressure is known to be low versus another where fishing pressure is known to be relatively high. And we can use fisher density as a proxy for fishing pressure. Evidence suggests that fisher density in the upper Gulf of California, there we go. Evidence suggests that fisher density in the upper Gulf of California is high, whereas density in the lower Pacific is presumed to be low. Preliminary evidence, um, that is a first pass at my hypothesis, um, suggests that yes, indeed, the fishing pressure associated with these two regions may give rise to disparate emission intensity estimates for these three classes of organisms. I'm sharing results for these stocks in particular, as these are the only stocks in the Gulf of California marine database for which we have overlapping taxa in both regions and appreciable sample size and gasoline information. While there may be reasons to find these results compelling, and indeed I do, fisher density is not a perfect proxy for fishing pressure or overfishing. Intuitively, one might reason that more fishers on the water relative to other areas would mean uh, more fish, less fish underwater, but we know that some areas and some populations are naturally more productive than others. So another way we can test the relationship between emission intensity and overfishing is to compare the average emission intensity associated with a particular stock to that stock's biomass. Stock biomass exists on a gradient from pristine to overfished, where biomass at MSY, that is maximum sustainable yield, exists somewhere in the middle of this gradient. Like its name suggests, maximum sustainable yield is the highest possible catch that can be exhumed from the water and sustained over time. While this is not the only paradigm by which managers manage fisheries, it is certainly a popular reference point. One proxy we can use to determine fisher stock stat fishery stock status and fishery sustainability overall is the ratio of current biomass B, as you see here, to that of maximum sustainable yield. And what we find is that as fishing increases, typically biomass decreases, and so too does the ratio of biomass to biomass at MSY. For reference, stocks with a pristine biomass are those with a ratio of two, and stocks that are considered overfish are those with a ratio less than 0.5. Stocks that are managed more or less perfectly at maximum sustainable yield have a ratio of one. For the second portion of my analysis, and I really, I should say our analysis, I intend to test the relationship between stock biomass and average fuel or emissions intensity for that stock where stock biomass is shown on the x-axis and fuel intensity is shown on the y. And hypothetically, uh, one might expect that average fuel intensity increases as stock biomass decreases. This relationship could also be nonlinear with some sort of convex or concave behavior. So briefly, I'm just going to share with you some of our raw data um, here we have an analysis based on 30% of the data available to us in the database. Each point is a separate stock with a value for average fuel intensity and a published value for stock biomass. 
At this point in time, we have yet to analyze stock biomass for all 90 of the stocks present to us in the database. And if there is a relationship, it's too soon to know what it looks like. But at this time, I'd also like to give a quick shout out to my friend and professional colleague, Dr. Alfredo Giron, who based on methods developed by Froze et al, was the one who ran and published the stock analysis for the stocks currently shown here. And now I'd like to pivot to the theory part of my presentation. Um, and again, because we're presenting with all sorts of presentation styles, the uh, PowerPoint have, has messed with the colors a little bit, but I hope it's still uh, relatively easy to follow. Thus far, I've told you about how small scale fisheries contribute to climate change via their relatively small climate fo carbon footprint. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about how climate change affects and is anticipated to affect small scale fisheries over time. But first it's helpful to understand small scale fisheries through the lens of the social ecological systems theory at the nexus of human society and the marine environment. As Rebecca mentioned in my bio, I believe that these realms, for lack of a better term, need to be considered one in the same, and the health of each is intimately tied to the future of small-scale fisheries. Typically, small-scale fisheries are buoyed up by a productive marine environment and a coherent and vibrant human society. However, let's skip to slide. However, a growing number of scientific articles suggest that climate change is likely to have negative expects, effects on small scale fisheries, largely mediated through the negative effects of climate change on society and the ocean. These consequences are expected to be pronounced in communities with limited adaptive capacity, resulting for various underlying socioeconomics and environmental factors. And so what we observe is essentially a feedback loop, albeit small, um, and this was talked about yesterday. And uh, if you're interested, I encourage you to read this report by the World Bank called The Sunken Billions Revisited. And uh, what I wanna end with is that it's up to us to disrupt this cycle by ending overfishing and rebuilding stocks. We can abate the negative effects of climate change on human society and marine ecosystems. For example, protecting against overfishing will help buffer fish populations against the deleterious effects of warming, as we discussed yesterday. And in time, we can shrink the footprint associated with all forms of production and stem the worst effects of climate change. But it's up to us, and I'd like to end with just a few key takeaways. Emissions, in <laughs> emissions vary considerably among small-scale fisheries. Some, from a carbon perspective, are quite sustainable, where others are not. Fishing intensity contributes to some of this variability and overfishing may have something to do with it. And finally, as a global society, we can enhance the resistance and resilience of SSFs to climate change by ending overfishing and rebuilding stocks. So with that, I'd like to th say thank you so much for listening and engaging with these topics. Thanks to our fish for hosting this webinar the various colleagues and collaborators who have made this work possible, and above all, the fishers and community members who work with the Gulf of California Marine Program. Fantastic, thank you, Erica. Super interesting. Um, it's, it's gonna be an, another excellent variety of presentations today uh, in terms of really focusing in on the different elements of how ending overfishing can deliver on these different climate and biodiversity um, objectives. So next we have, if you have questions for Erica, please pop them into the Q&A and we'll come to them later. In the meantime, um, we're going to go to Dr. Sebastian Viasante, who will present Managing European fisheries through ecosystem interactions would improve climate resilience. Dr. Viasante is Associate Professor at the Department of Applied Economics at the University of Santiago de Compostela in Spain. And he is Carl Guran Mala Scholar at the Beja Institute of Ecological Economics in Sweden. Sebastian is interested in understanding the role of marine biodiversity for well-being and social transformative changes of marine socio-ecological socio systems. 
He's currently coordinator of the European Research Council Consolidator Grant Equal C, Transformative Adaptation Towards Ocean Equity. And he's founder of the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea Working Group on Resilience and Marine Ecosystem Services, the Ecosystem Services Partnership Working Group on Economic Valuation of Marine Ecosystem Services, co-lead author of the IPBES Transformative Change Scoping Assessment, and member of the EU's Scientific, Technical and Economic Committee for Fisheries. He's been an invited speaker at several international organizations, such as the Convention on Biological Diversity and the United Nations, and is also a member of the editorial board of scientific, scientific journals, Ambio, Ecosystems and People, Marine Policy, and Plosone. I'm not sure if you're actually meant to spell that out, but obviously another extremely well credentialed um, scientist. So. Dr. Viasante, I hand the floor to you. Thanks, Sebastian. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Okay. 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 Well, uh, good morning, afternoon, and even for uh, all attendants. Uh, and much thanks to the organizer for this uh, great symposium and for your kind invitation. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. Uh, my talk is about fisheries management through carbon sequestration and how, in our view, could improve climate resilience globally. Um, a life on our planet depend on healthy oceans and planetary stewardship is nowadays recognizes uh, sustainable development goals. As we know, in 2015, the United Nations approved for the first time an aspirational socioeconomic goal based on equity, universality for all of citizens in the world, which is really extraordinary. A new integrated approach as shown in this slide has been proposed, which states that from the 70 goals there are uh, four key objectives. Objective uh, 14, life below water, 13, climate change, objective six, clean water, and objective 15, biodiversity. Because the only way in which we can have a just and equitable social inclusive development is by having health ecosystem and biodiversity and reduce climate change impact. However, it has been recently shown that fishing activities, in particular by focusing on large uh, species and large fishes, has been removing massive amount of blue carbon from the oceans when fisheries catch were landed, processed, and consumed, therefore emitting atmospheric CO2 emissions. And as you can see on the figure A in this slide, the total blue carbon extraction from the oceans has been increased steadily, steadily since the 1950s. Nevertheless, for economic theory, there are many kinds of natural capital like carbon sequestration for which simply there are no markets. So they, they are free to the users basically. And the macroeconomic growth and, the, and developing theories that have shaped our uh, belief and our understanding on the progress of nations do not recognize humanity depends on nature which are not usually included in the decision-making process. This is why we need to try to correct this and develop methods for accounting shadow prices. For example, uh, in figure uh, uh, in the right of, of this slide, uh, this study from the UNED uh, program showed that if we include produce human and also natural capital together, we can find that globally produced capital per head double since 2092 to, 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 uh, to 2014, uh, while human capital have increased by 30 per, by 13%, but the value of the stock of natural capital per head declined by nearly 40% in that period. So, how we could account shadow price for the blue carbon sequestration. 
There are several ways, but one of them is by using existing carbon markets to consider the blue carbon prevented by global fisheries catch. Because by doing so, the fisheries sector will be at the same level of other industries. The carbon market could be a solution to achieve global targets of CO2 emissions, but it is also necessary to emphasize that enterprises or countries who emit them have realistic targets which reflect the climate urgency we are currently living. As we know, the, the European Union emission trading system is the main uh, system to reduce climate change in Europe. And by developing this, this, uh, this uh, system, uh, right now it's covering around three quarter percentage of global trade, uh, of, of global carbon trade emissions in the world. And, and this is uh, a system basic, uh, based in a cap and trade system in which a cap, a cap is set on the total amount of certain greenhouse uh, gases that can be emitted by enterprises covered by the system. And the cap is reduced over time so that total emissions fail over time. So our suggestion is why we could not consider the potential inclusion of the fishery sector in this carbon market uh, trade emission as developing in Europe. Because we consider that society implicitly are now assigning carbon emissions allowance to the fishery sector. And the carbon market could be uh, a mechanism to try to know the social cost of fishing over time. And here, what we made is to estimate the economic value of prevented blue carbon sequestration by using the uh, sea around us database, by including mainly report uh, catch for the period 2010 to 2016, and also by disaggregating fishing, uh, FAO fishing areas, as well as trying to differentiate the small scale and also uh, industrial fisheries. The, this type of mechanism could help to limit or reduce fishing activities or even increase, increase them, but basically to identify which of those activities are socially negative in terms of sea protein and carbon prevented. Even under the limitation of existing carbon markets, such as the fact that social prices are usually higher than the landed values of fish, or for example, the lack of compliance of carbon of countries. If we estimate the value of prevented carbon sequestered to Manas fishing fleet around the world, we can obtain here the curve of blue carbon supply, which indicate that for each price of carbon ton in the carbon market, we will know how much and where it will be possible to increase or reduce fishing activities in order to achieve uh, a higher blue carbon sequestration. And using the example of the average profitability for the European fishing fleet during the last three years, which is estimated to be uh, 40% per year, we could assume that an investor who could obtain a similar profitability will be interested to obtain a similar profitability, but for a higher carbon sequestration. In red, we highlight in the figure the point in which the target of reduction uh, established by the Paris Agreement uh, in order to achieve the, uh, the, the uh, 1.5 degrees is achieved for 2050. It is important to highlight these these mechanisms will not be used will not use carbon market to compensate for not fishing. Rather. It could be used to show that incorporating the, the industrial fishing fleet in the list of sector, participating in the emission trading system could help to consider shadow price of blue carbon. The key question here would be, will our society to expect value $1,000 each per ton of carbon by 2050? This map shows the result of, of applying these mechanisms to the industrial fishery sector. The results present the difference between the scenario of landings, assuming the use of the carbon market, in relation to the status quo, that is, without carbon markets. Overall, there is not an increase of, glo of global catch over time, while there is a reduction of catch in some areas, such as the Antarctic in the Indonesian Ocean, 
the Atlantic Western Central, the Mediterranean Sea, or the Pacific Southwest in Oceania. This, this proposal of using carbon market to include car blue carbon sequestration uh, will also have a potential redistributional impact on the value of landing by following, for example, the ocean panel recommendations. It will be a mechanism to reduce the current inequality in value landings, and it will be have also a better distribution of value landing for those fishing segments which will require lower carbon sequestration for this catch. To sum up, uh, this type of mechanism will need for sure an institutional accept, uh, acceptance and, and will depend at the end on the political decision to implement in some degree. But in the end, it will, it will provide a low carbon fishing by increasing fish biomass and carbon sequestration over time, and ultimately leading to a more resilient fish and ocean. And also will have a social benefits because it will provide a more equitative distribution of fishery resources. But in any case, this will be one of the possibilities within the portfolio of solution to reduce overfishing and reduce the impact of climate change, which are in the end non rivally with other current fisheries management system, like for example, marine protect area. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Sebastian. Another different angle on, on the issue. So next up, we have Dr. Emma Carvin presenting Fish, Fisheries and Carbon Sequestration. Dr. Carvin is a research fellow in the Marine Carbon Cycle, Fisheries and Climate Change at Imperial College London in the UK. She's a biogeochemist specializing in ocean carbon cycling by marine life. Emma has a Bachelor of Marine Biology and a PhD in Oceanography from the National Oceanography Centre in the UK and did her first postdoctoral position in marine biogeochemistry at the University of Tasmania in Australia before she returned to the UK for her second postdoc on ecological modelling and starting her current position at the Imperial College in London as an independent research fellow. Emma has experience in working with policymakers and NGOs to promote the importance of the natural carbon sinks in the ocean, working from plankton to seagrasses. And as you're about to see, she has a keen interest in Antarctic krill because of their importance in the carbon sink, but also because they're just very awesome. So with that, I will hand over to Dr. Carbon. Awesome. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Rebecca. Um, yeah, hi everyone. So I'm gonna be talking about um, fish fisheries and carbon sequestration. So how uh, the basically biology uh, stores carbon in the ocean. And this is work that I've done with um, Dr. Simeon Hill at the British Antarctic Survey, and also Dr. Grace Saba from um, Rutgers University. So uh, as you've seen this slide before, this shows the key topics of um, this symposium. And I'm going to be focusing on how fish, marine life and food webs store and sink carbon from the atmosphere to the deep ocean. But I'm also gonna to touch really briefly on how the sea floor and marine habitat can be impacted. And everything I'm presenting today is really to promote stopping overfishing, um, which is a real key policy and decision um, making thing that needs to happen basically. So in the ocean plankton and fish store carbon and this is a schematic that um, I had made and published a few years ago and as you can see there's lots of arrows everywhere and it's quite complicated but I'm going to walk you all through it but what I really want you to take home from this is this box red with the red outline box on the left which says that this carbon sink stores atmospheric carbon dioxide for decades to millennia, so for tens, hundreds and up to a thousand years. And it stores carbon by basically taking it from the atmosphere and putting it in the deep ocean where it's kind of stored really far away from the atmosphere for these really long times. So it's really relevant for climate. 
And what happens is in the surface ocean, you have primary production um, by phytoplankton. So the phytoplankton are single celled marine algae and they take up CO2 that's dissolved, so carbon dioxide that's dissolved from the atmosphere into the surface ocean. And they photosynthesize just like leaves and plants do on land and turn that carbon dioxide into organic matter. And now most of the marine algae, those phytoplankton will be grazed upon by zooplankton, but about maybe about 50% end up um, dying before they're eaten and they kind of aggregate together to, for these, to form these kind of larger detrital, sticky, brown um, kind of bits of fluff really that sink to the deep ocean at hundreds of meters per day. And these aggregates are really rich and full of carbon. And another way that um, plankton can sink carbon is um, through grazing by zooplankton. So zooplankton are the animal part of the plankton community, things like shrimp, they graze and feed upon the phytoplankton and then the uh, zooplankton, these shrimp actually defecate, so they poo basically, and these are far sinking fecal pellets that sink to the deep ocean. So what do you get at about 100, 200 meters deep in the ocean is this huge pool of sinking particles, so either as these kind of dead plankton um, cells, plant cell aggregates, or as uh, fecal pellets, and they rain down to the deep ocean and drive the sink of carbon. And this number that you see on the screen in this red box of up to 12, that's up to 12 gigatons of carbon per year globally, is sinking in this massive sink of carbon. And that is about the same magnitude give or take, <laughs> on the same order of magnitude as the amount of carbon pumped into the atmosphere by humans. So this is a really, really important sink that's important to us as humans, but obviously it's important to make sure this ecosystem kind of, you know, is still thriving. But it's not just the plankton community that is engaging in this carbon sink. Phytoplankton at the base of all most marine food webs in the ocean and so anything that consumes them consumes them is directly involved in this carbon cycle so that includes things like fish so fish and jellyfish can also be part of this carbon cycle because they defecate so their poo is even larger than that of the smaller shrimp and sinks, sinks really quickly to the deep ocean and also they migrate through the water column so those that um kind of a trans like feed at the surface and then maybe defecate or respire and release CO2 in the deep ocean are going to be even more important in storing carbon there. And I just want to emphasize that um, this is a kind of like a blue carbon sink. So you might have heard the term blue carbon around seagrasses or mangroves, but actually this whole plankton and fish carbon sink is another term of blue carbon, but not all fish mass that is removed from the ocean is necessarily going to be a carbon sink, which I think is important to note here. It's only that that makes it into the deep ocean. But we really know very little about how much fish are contributing to the carbon sink. And this study was done by um, Grace Saba at Rutgers University and with her colleagues. And they basically did a review which came out literally last month, I think, to look at everything that we know as scientists about what fish, are, uh, like how fish are contributing to this carbon sink. So some of these processes I've already meant, gone through, so the fact that fish can defecate um, and respire releasing CO2, but also when they excrete they can le release carbon, they're migrating vertically and horizontally through the water column, and also fish fall, so basically dead fish biomass that falls to the deep ocean uh, may then get buried in sediments. And what they found was that um, fish can contribute to the carbon sink, um, well they can contribute about 16% of the total organic carbon sink. And I said that was up to about 12 gigatons of carbon um, driven by plankton and fish can contribute 16% of this. So it's still a pretty significant number and pretty huge. And the types of fish that are contributing to this are things like anchovy, herring and sardines. So these are forage fish and they tend to be smaller, the smaller kind of lower trophic level fish, which means they're lower down the food chain. And basically the lower down the food chain you are, the closer you are to the marine algae, the more likely and more, more likely you're going to have a like a high role in this carbon sink. And that's because as you go up the food chain, um, 
energy is lost and carbon is lost. So these species are going to be much more important in sinking carbon than say a massive tuna. Um, and we know that they have large fecal pellets, that their pellets sink at hundreds of meters per day. And also there's just a huge biomass of these forage fish. There's so many of them and they form some of the biggest fisheries on earth. And so um, by removing these fish, we really are removing such an important sink of carbon in the ocean, which is so beneficial to us all. So I'm now going to step through the different ways that fisheries can be impacting and kind of interfering with this carbon sink and ways we might think about trying to um, prevent this and kind of maintain this natural carbon sink. So again, I will walk through this graphic, but just to show this kind of inverted green triangle, that's kind of representing the fact that in the surface ocean, we have lots of marine algae. So they're the phytoplankton that are drawing down CO2, and then they sink to the deep ocean. And you always, you get less um, marine algae sinking than you do in the surface, because obviously some is consumed and it's consumed all the way down, but you still get a reasonable number um, that reaches the deep ocean and the carbon that's stored there. And also I've represented some kind of green poos <laughs> coming out of things like um, anchovy and krill in this slide. And so on the left, we have some direct impacts of fishing on the carbon sink and on the right, some indirect impacts. So just to start going through this, um, here I'm like, uh, representing that we have species that are important in fertilizing marine algae. So actually the feces of things like seabirds and whales can actually promote algal growth. So just like manure on farm um, to you know, stimulate growth of farm crops, feces in the ocean can also stimulate algal growth. So they're really important in promoting um, this drawdown of carbon dioxide. And as I've mentioned quite a few times, um, my other name is Dr. Plankton Poo, because I do talk about poo a lot, um, is that things like krill and fish are, um, are releasing fecal pellets that get down to the deep ocean. So then to talk about how fishing is impacting this. So just really simply, fishing has direct impacts on this really huge carbon sink by just removing sinkers, uh, fish that are important in sinking krill. So by, uh, sorry, sinking krill, uh, are in sinking um, fecal pellets. So things like those forage fish that I showed you before. So things like herring, sardines and anchovies, also things like mackerel. And also fisheries um, remove things like ground fish, such as cod and pollock that live near the sediment. And anything that lives near the sediment, any feces that it defecates is only gonna have a short way to go. And so therefore it's not gonna be really be consumed and it's gonna get buried within the sediments really quickly. So these um, so species that live near the bottom could be really important in this carbon sink. And also these fisheries, um, because they have to catch things near the seabed can resuspend sediment. And that sediment will have carbon that's been locked in there for a very, very long time. And therefore, when this carbon, when the sediment gets resuspended in the water column, that carbon can then be released and then actually um, exchanged back with the atmosphere. So it could be a positive kind of feedback, releasing CO2 eventually. And then finally, another direct impact is just by removing species that live deeper in the ocean. So as I said, some fish migrate, some fish actually just live near live deeper in the water column. And again, like with the ground fish, their feces and the CO2 that they release deep in the ocean is not gonna have very far to go before it kind of gets locked in to the deep ocean stores. And then when we move over to the indirect effect that fisheries can have, um, the first one I've highlighted here is trophic cascades. So a trophic cascade is basically when you remove a top predator or a, or a fish higher up the food chain. So things like if you remove tuna and there's less tuna in the ocean, you might have more of the prey that they feed on, maybe an anchovy, for instance, which maybe that's good because they, they sink loads of fecal pellets, but then you might have less um, krill because there's too many anchovy or you know their food type and basically you're just disturbing the balance of the ecosystem and you're going to be impacting biogeochemical cycles and this carbon sink so we really you know this isn't a good um, story for carbon and other biogeochemical cycles in the ocean and again you could be impacting indirectly other predators that feed on these really important sinkers of carbon um, including things like fertilizing species such as seabirds 
and these seabirds and others that are important um, in releasing fecal pellets can get caught as bycatch. So really there are so many ways that fisheries can be impacting the ocean. And the last one that I put on here is to do with discards. So we know that there's a lot of discards thrown overboard from ships um, to, because they have to match quotas. And so this is just a huge amount of dead organic matter that's just kind of in this localized area and bacteria can kind of go nuts and um, decay it at a really high rate and just change the whole biogeochemistry um, and nutrient regime of an area and release a lot of carbon that otherwise just would be swimming around the ocean and would be sunk in a more natural um, way for a longer for a longer time period. So the second part of this study was we wanted to see where it was really important in the carbon sink and fishing intensity. So on the top graph or top map, you see the global ocean and this shows the carbon sink. So where it's yellow, bright yellow, there's a really high carbon sink and where it's purple is a low carbon sink. So as we would expect, then where um, the ocean is most productive around the coast is where you get a high carbon sink. And on the bottom, graph you can see fishing intensity again with yellow being really high and because <laughs> the coasts are more productive then you get really high fishing intensity around the coastal oceans and when we overlap these two maps on top of each other you can see where is high carbon sink from the plankton and the fish and high fishing intensity so all these orange pixels are where you get really high carbon sinks and high fishing intensity and unfortunately for Europe it comes up as the kind of highest carbon sink and the highest and the most fish region, um, corresponding to 14% of the global carbon sink and 15% of fishing intensity. So this is massive and so Europe is a really important region to protect. It's mostly dominated by trawls and Atlantic mackerel and herring are the two most caught fish. So these are those smaller forage fish that are really important in sinking fecal pellets and a huge biomass and also Atlantic cod which is a ground excuse me, a ground fish, which will be having a short route of any um, fecal pellets it releases there or its own biomass when they, when they die. So just to really emphasize this, European seas are the most fish and the highest carbon sink, and they're dominated by the most important carbon sinkers. Um, so the fishery is most dominated by um, small pelagic fish, the really important carbon sinkers. So I'm just going to finish now with my take home messages and that is that hopefully you are convinced that marine life is an essential and natural sink of CO2. It was perfectly in balance before we came along and pumped the atmosphere with uh, CO2 and started fishing on industrial levels and Europe is the highest region of fishing intensity in the world and the highest carbon sink. And if we could reduce overfishing in Europe and in other regions, we will help protect the sink and store of atmospheric CO2. And thank you, I will finish there. Amazing, thank you, Emma. That was super clear and really well presented and in uh, classic, not particularly classic scientist fashion, I just, the graphics are really, really clear and really helpful to understand as well. So great, another interesting um, angle on the climate and biodiversity interactions of and impacts of fisheries and benefits of fish. So last but not least, we have Dr. Ibrahim Isipu presenting impacts of climate change, overfishing and pollution on fisheries a risk management and solution policy framework. Dr. Isifu is a postdoctoral research fellow in interdisciplinary oceans and fisheries economics at the Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries, University of British Columbia. He obtained his PhD and masters from Nagoya University in Japan and bachelor and masters in economics from the University of Ghana, Accra. His main research interests lie in the intersection of marine pollution, fisheries economics, and ocean sustainability. He has worked as a research assistant and as a health economist in Japan, and also has experience teaching microeconomics at UBC Forestry. Dr. Isifu collaborated with Pew Charitable Trusts and Systemic to develop the flagship report on Breaking the Plastic Wave, a comprehensive assessment of pathways towards stopping ocean plastic pollution, among others. Another very interesting presentation coming up 
I just want to remind everyone, oh, it looks like we have quite a number, just to put your questions in the Q&A, we're on time. And so hopefully we will be able to answer some of those live after uh, Ibrahim has finished his presentation. So over to you, Ibrahim. Mike, Mike, can you put it on? Good. Uh, thank you so much, Rebecca, for a very wonderful introduction. And thanks everyone all over the world for joining. I'm so excited to be here. So today we are going to, I'm going to present the impact of climate change over fishing and pollution in uh, fisheries, risk management and solution framework. So we, we are four in the team. I'm with uh, Rashid is also part of it and Vicky Lam and uh, Juan Jos Alava. So we are all part of UBC, especially Ocean and Fisheries Department of UBC. So this is how we are going to do. So first, let's look at the weight of the evidence. Can we go to the next slide? So the next slide tells us the weight of the evidence of, uh, of climate change over fishing and pollution impact on fisheries. So you can see a lot of scientific journals, headlines about projected amplification of food web by accumulation. This was written by my friend, Alava, as well as climate change and overfishing increases, you know, toxicant in marine predators. So these are some of the headlines that you come across that highlights how the health of the world oceans are declining. For a better term, our ocean is under siege from climate change, overfishing and pollution. Yeah, can we move to the next slide? So the first global assessment of cumulative human impact on oceans published in science shows that 40% of the world oceans are highly impacted by human activities, such as overfishing and pollution. So the assessment was led by Ben Halpert, who, who showed where the cumulative impacts are, the greatest and the least, and which kind of uh, stresses or is driving this particular result. As shown in this slide, as you can see, the map showed the, the human impact on marine Yeah, I was trying to put my video on, but it's not able to, to, be, to be on. Sorry for that. So as the map showed the global map of human impact on marine ecosystem, the highly impacted regions are, you can see from this particular scale. Good. Yeah, thank you so much for giving me the access. So this map shows uh, the human impact on marine ecosystem. So you can see that it is on a scale. We have very low impacts and add to a very high impact. So looking at this map, you can see that Eastern Caribbean is, which is uh, B on, on, at, the down, at the down of the globe. So Eastern Caribbean is one of Eastern Caribbean, North Sea and Japanese waters are some of the most highly impacted areas as far as human activities is concerned. And this could be possibly a spreading dead zones with uh, bad consequences for our marine what, environment. Happily, or we are still fortunate, not everything is lost. We can see that North Australia and the tourist areas are the least impacted areas as reported by this particular study. Can we move to the next slide? Good. So now let's look at another, another evidence to show that actually our oceans are under, under siege. So let's look at overfishing and fisheries decline. And this is reported by Polly and Sila in 2016. You can see that, look at the first figure. The figure one is trajectory of reported and reconstructed marine fisheries catches from 1950 to 2010. You look at the, the black line, which is the reconstructed catch started to decline since uh, around 19, 1990s. That is when we started to see that there's a very sharp decline of what fisheries, uh, global fisheries stocks, at least about 10% it reached the peak in 2000 in 1990s and started to decline about 10%. And also about 30 to 60% of fishery stocks are overexploited globally. Increasingly, the ocean is threatened. Most of the world fisheries are being overfished. So let's take a look at figure two, which actually give a case of Northwest Atlantic where industrial fishing activities actually originated. That part of figure two demonstrates the declining catches, especially for commercial important species like cod, et cetera. 
So, and even to support that, the United Nations Biodiversity Report reminded us that direct exploitation of fishes has the largest uh, relative negative impact on nature since 1970s. Uh, can we go to the next slide? So the next slide talk about climate change impact on fisheries revenue. This was uh, a paper uh, published by my co-author, like published by one of my, my pan the paper, one of the, our panelists, like uh, that is Vicky, Vicky Lam. It was published in 2016. And this particular paper talks about the percentage change in fisheries maximum revenue potential is mapped against human development index of countries under high climate change scenario. That is a high CO2 emission scenario of 8.5 uh, by 2050. So each bumble here represents the bigger the size of the bumble, it tells the larger the percentage of economic impact of fisheries sector to the total gross domestic product. You can see on the right side, you have positive impact on the vertical axis and negative impact. And you also have uh, that one tells us that as the extreme left, which is the Y axis, you see the percentage change in maximum revenue potentials. And on the horizontal, you see low human development index and high human development index. So let's see which, so climate change is going to produce winners and losers as far as uh, fisheries is concerned. So this particular chart tells us that some countries are going to be negatively be affected. Let's take a country like uh, uh, Tobulo and uh, Tokulo. So these are the countries in the Pacific. They are likely to be negatively be affected. And some countries are going to be winners as far as climate change is concerned, a high scenario. And some of the countries like Greenland and uh, Iceland, these are some of the countries that are going to benefit in terms of climate change in the what a bad case scenario or worst case scenario of uh, CO2 8.5. Yes, please, let's move to the next slide. Good. So we came out with a conceptual framework, what we are going to do in this particular research. So we look at climate change over fishing pollution assessment framework. So this particular figure tells you how climate change interact with overfishing as well as pollution. So with overfishing, we have IUU, that is illegal, unreported, and uh, unregulated fisheries, as well as bycatch, just like what Ima has talked about. Bycatch is one of the things that falls under overfishing. And we have chemical and biological pollutant like mercury, plastic, microplastic, they all fall under chemical and biological pollutant. And climate change, we have sea surface temperature, pH and oxygen, etc. We see how these things are going to interact and their effects or the risks that they pose into marine fisheries, food web and the eco resilience. So let us take a look at the interaction between climate change pollution in the Northeast Pacific. So we are going to look at Northeastern Pacific. Exactly, this was led by my colleague, Dr. Alava. So please, next slide. Good. So this particular slide looks a little bit complex, but it's very simple to understand. So this is a very specific case of uh, how climate change interact with pollution. And it is specifically located where this particular case is in the what? Northeastern North Pacific. This is where this analysis was done. So please pay attention. I will take a little bit of your time to explain this uh, chart very well. So we have worst case scenario where CO2 is around 8.5 and we have my, my mitigation scenario or low CO2 scenario, which is 2.6. And we have our reference baseline. That is when there's no CO2. So this chart is telling us that when climate change interact with pollution, it's going to amplify, it's, uh, it's going to amplify the pollution and this pollution will lead to what? By accumulation, especially something like uh, metal mercury in what marine food web. And all this in is what is, is transmitted from low uh, trophic level species like uh, phytozotoplaton and phytoplaton. These things are going to absorb this particular pollutant and higher trophic species like uh, Chinook, uh, Salmon and Will, this de depends on this smaller species, they feed on it and that transmission, it passed through the food were propagated from the lower level to the higher level. And hopefully uh, human beings, which, which we all know, we all depend, so many people depends on seafood and this will be propagated 
it will pose health risks on people who consume seafood. So this particular chart just tells us that climate change is going to amplify and our worst case scenario, that is with uh, CO2 with 8.5 or what we call representative concentration power of 8.5 will amplify by accumulation of organic mercury into the marine food web. And this will not be good for human health as well as uh, our ecosystem. Please, let's move to the next slide. Good. So this, the next slide talks about intergovernmental panel on climate change. The inter intergovernmental panel on climate change outlines the adaptation assessment framework on climate change pollutant interaction and their impact. So in the next slide, let's we'll see. So this one, climate change and what pollutant is poor, just like what the previous slides I talked about, which was specifically for the East, uh, North Eastern Pacific. So this one is from what? IPCC, and it talks about how climate change interact with what? Pollutant. So look at the diagram very well. We have our climate change uh, variables like CO2, we have salinity change, water level, oxygen, etc. cetera, will interact with pollutant. And it poses effects, the effect on individuals, on the population along the coasts, as far as, and as well as what? Ecosystem, the gene expression of what fishes or marine species. Marine species, some of them are going to reduce in size, etc. good. So, and some are even going to collapse. So, because some are very sensitive to what uh, changes into marine environment as far as pollution is concerned. So the risk is that going to ecosystem health impact is, is going to increase the, what, the risk to ecosystem health and human impact is going to health to, the risk to human impact is going to increase and social and economic impact is also going to increase the risk to that is going to increase. So this particular figure was developed by IPCC. Let's take a look at the next slide. So we, what we did was that after we have looked at the IPCC, we combined it with overfishing. So here you look at global and regional climates, which we have talked about, and also look at pollution. So we added overfishing. Overfishing is the blue, the blue bar. So we see how the interaction of global climate change, overfishing, and pollution will interact and how is going is sensitivity or vulnerability responses to marine what ecosystem. First, it's going to affect the shrinking of fish size. Fish size and fish size are going to reduce because it's going to affect the, re the reproductive capacity of our marine environment. So some fish stocks are going to collapse or collapsing of some fish stocks. We also have changes in the food web. Food web changes structure is going to change and also changing when the traffic transfer pathways. I've explained this one earlier from the lower traffic level to the higher traffic level. It also increases of pollutant exposure in the fish species. And also, it will also exacerbate of what food web contaminant by accumulation. And the risk is that, well, if all this is done, so ecosystem health and resilience is going to reduce and fisheries health and rehabilitation is going to be negatively be impacted and positive health in public health impact is also going to be negatively impacted when overfishing combines interact with global uh, climate change also interact with what pollution all these things are going to pose a very serious threat to uh, the marine environment especially the shrink of the fish size and excess so multiple stressor interaction their impact framework so what we did here was to add overfishing to what has previously been developed by IPCC. We have the global and climate change developed by IPCC and we also have pollution interacting. And so we added overfishing. This is our contribution. We are going to see how it's going to affect what marine environment as far as resilience is concerned. Let's move to the next slide. Good. So the next slide tells us that, well, let's look at the universals. What are the universal policy pathways that we are going to use to mitigate, reduce, and eliminate overfishing? Fossil fuels, emissions, and pollution risks with associated impact. So first, we have on the right, we have command and control. These are some of the universal policies that we can use. So by the command and control, the key term here is bottom-down policy from the top, bottom-down policy, and on, the, on my right, you see the preventive approach, and that is what we call bottom-up policy. So we have command and control policy, like setting up rules and standards to reduce uh, chemical pollution, et cetera. So those are what the top-down policy. So we see how top-down policy, what we are advocating is that 
So we have top-down polite business as usual, end of the end of the pipe or fight fire fighter approach. And we also have municipal regulation and emission controls. We have permit and environmental volutions, environmental valuations, fines and penalties. So those will fall under command and control, which is uh, top down policy. And the preventive approach, which we want, the proactive and prevention approach, which is very good, that is bottom up policies, because no single policy will be able to control this particular issue, this particular challenge that our oceans are facing after our oceans are under siege. So what we need is that we are saying that top down instrument or, top, or command and control rule based policy should need to address bottom up capabilities. So we need a top down instrument to address bottom up capabilities to transform the world marine fishery into a more sustainable uh, and resilient pathway. Good. Let's move to the next slide. So the next slide, yeah, this is what we are, we are trying to advocate. We are advocating that, well, let's globe, climate change is a global issue. So we need mit mitigation and adaptation policies so to mitigate climate change. And with pollution, well, pollution, we need to meet, pollution is the byproduct of something that we all cherish, either by transportation, by the food we produce, they all release some pollution. So we need an optimal amount of pollution. So what we need are less control and eliminate pollution. When we control pollution, of course, we can't eliminate pollution completely, but we can control to get some optimal amount of pollution. So when we mitigate climate change and we control and uh, we control pollution levels and also end overfishing. Overfishing, if we end overfishing, especially illegal, unreported, unregulated fisheries, then the, it's going to prevent what? Shrinking of the fish species. Because we said that when climate change, overfishing and uh, pollution interact, it's going to have a very negative, it's going to have a negative impact on, uh, on our, uh, the size of the fishes, the, some fish are going to collapse. So when we interact this one, we are going to reduce what the risks. All these are going to what, increase the ecosystem health resilience, and it's also what improve what fish ability. Let's move to the next. So the next chart just give us a policy decision or what we call ocean solution triangle. So we have overfishing, we have our CO2 emissions and pollution. So we are going to use preventive approach on the top. You can see that's a bottom up approach. And we also have control and command approach. We have market base. So all these are the policies that we are going to come out with to solve the problem of uh, pollution. So please, let's move to the next. So the next step is, well, we are going to model we are going to model climate change, overfishing, and pollution. So we are going to use dynamic by climate envelope model. We'll get our fishing data from sea runners and climate change data from IPCC and pollution data, especially mercury. We can get from global set. So uh, we'll, move, we'll go to our take home message. Please next. Good, so what is the take home message? Yes, for now we have, we have not finished with our analysis. So but these are some of the good cases that we can use to solve the problem of what? Overfishing, climate change and uh, pollution. First, we have seen that any overfishing is a necessary evil. We have to end overfishing. And we have also seen that ecosystem monitoring is very important. We can see a case in the Pacific, what we call the eight parties to the narrow agreement. They have used what we call vessel uh, scheme days, increase the fees, and they have ended overfishing or they have reduced overfishing and they have also increased revenue. And the last one, we need legislation. This especially climate change issues are very global issues. So legislation can also be helped. And also our fisheries struggle to restore fisheries, we need legislations to do that. So thank you very much for uh, attending and uh, for listening to my presentation. So these are my co-presenters, co uh, my co-people in my team. We have uh, Vicky and uh, Alava and Rashid, as we all know. So thanks for your time and I appreciate your attention. Thank you so much. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank yeah. you, yeah. Ibrahim. That's Good. fantastic. Works for oceans, resilient works for everyone. Beautiful. So at this point, we have managed to stick with our time for our presentations today, which is very exciting. So we have some time to answer questions live. So I'll just ask each of the presenters to put their videos on. And uh, 
and Dr. Samela as well. Rashid and I will moderate through some of the questions and answers. Um, I'll start by choosing um, some questions for Erica. So I'm just actually going to, we'll, we'll, we might combine the questions a little bit. Um, so thank you again to everyone for your presentations. I think it's a common theme that people really appreciate the presentations and they've been fantastic. Um, so Erica Jonas asks if we can, if you can generalize the carbon footprint of small scale fishes by target species assuming that fishing gear and vessel type are the reason for differences among carbon footprints. And slightly related to that, uh, Karen asks, would you have more info on the different emission outputs for catching a given species like shrimp that you showed? Yeah, I saw that question in the chat and was really hopeful that we'd get to it. Uh, I think it's a great question and the uh, attendee has kind of correctly surmised that a lot of the variability we see between classes has to do with gear type. So uh, demersal mollusks in, at least in Northwest Mexico are often landed using hookah, meaning that they, they take their boats and they have this air supply, uh, surface supplied air, and they can target you know specific beds of demersal mollusks. Uh, whereas shrimp, for the most part, uh, at least in the data I have, had about 80% of the shrimp landings uh, were landed using small trawlers and the other 20% were landed using uh, small gill nets. And uh, I talk about it a little bit in that paper, which if you uh, want the, the paper, it's in press now, but uh, feel free to reach out to me. But I do talk about the effects of gear. And so for this talk, I know it seems like ages ago now, but I was really trying to focus on the variability within classes of organisms. So instead of trying to look at the variability across organisms, because I think uh, the attendee is correct, like you can't really make that generalization. Uh, I will be most interested to look within gear type, within classes of organisms. Um, so yeah, thanks very much for that question. Thanks, Erica. I'm <laughs> Rashid. Are you? Yeah. You're... For some reason, my my video is not sure, and I put it on, but it's not. Uh, you can't see me for some reason. Yeah, but you can hear me, right? We can hear you perfectly. Oh, Go uh, ahead. The most important thing. Yeah. So, uh, a question for Emma here: uh, What is the impact of uh, eutrophication on blue carbon sinks? You know. Yeah, so I haven't um, thought a huge amount of eutrophication. I guess it's similar to what I was kind of saying about the discards and just creating a localised region of really high nutrients. Um, if it was preventing algal growth because there were too many nutrients and um, blocking sunlight because there was kind of too much growth, then eventually it might mean that there'd be uh, less CO2 drawdown because the algae can't grow and can't photosynthesise. But um, it, this is definitely something that needs to be looked into. Um, hopefully what you got from my talk, there's like lots of different kind of tenets of this process. And it's a really, um, we're just kind of starting out on this to try and figure out and quantify each one of them. But yeah, really interesting to think about eutrophication. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, so I take the next question for, I think I will uh, pass it on to Sebastian. Um, but uh, the question I didn't direct it to any one of you. So Sebastian, you get a, a crack at this and then we'll see. Uh, and I like the question a lot because it brings an angle to the whole discussion here. And the question is how much uh, does the sequestrated, uh, sequestration of carbon impact seafloor invertebrates, such as deep sea coral sponges, you know? so. Uh, I think, uh, putting my economic mind here, the person is saying that, hey, hey, you guys watch out, baby. All the sequestration is not hum hum harmless, right? So how about those invertebrates that live on the seafloor? Yeah, that, thank, you for the, thank you for the question. And thanks, Rajiv. Yeah, this is an, an interesting and in, very important question. Um, um, honestly, uh, I don't remember exactly the the, uh, the values uh, for because we have 
uh, I guess that the, the question you're referring to the to 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 our estimate about uh, how much uh, prevented blue carbon uh, could be sequestered by using this type of market uh, trade uh, systems, uh, and we have used all of the species around the world. So honestly, I do not remember exactly, but maybe uh, other uh, you know uh, biological uh, or, or biologists and other colleagues who know better than me. Uh, probably could be in the better position to answer that. But this is a task for home to, to work. Thank yeah. you. Uh, that, that's very good. That's why we are interdisciplinary. Anyone on the board who, who has something to add to this question? The biologists and natural scientists. Anyone well, else? very quick. I often think of the deep sea as the real final frontier. Um, and we're constantly discovering new and interesting facts about it. So I think right now it's still difficult to say what sort of defines hazardous fishing in, in the areas, you know, beneath where the sunlight touches. Yeah, fantastic. Again, I like the answer. What you're telling the audience is, hey, we are scientists. We don't have all the answers. There are work that are in progress, which is beautiful. Got to be honest about this. So thank you, Erica, for that. Back to you, um, Beck. Uh, I'll just jump in quickly. Sorry, oh, I was yes, oh, okay. no, I was just oh, checking yeah. my info on Google. <laughs> but I could point you to David Barnes. He's um, a, a British researcher, David Barnes, and he's done lots on um, blue carbon storage in deep sea corals mm -hmm. and sponges and all of that. So, um, and there has been some papers published by him and his colleagues um, in Nature recently. Super. David Barnes. Okay. That's the name. All right. Thanks for the additional info. Okay. Thanks, Emma. Okay. So we have, a, I have a question for Ibrahim. Given that illegal fishing is a major global issue, how do you think it can be contained or reduced by fishing management authorities and governments? Mm -hmm. that, that, that's a very beautiful question. And, uh, we all know the impact of IUU, how it's, it's affecting, uh, it's leading to over exploitation of our fish stock. And it's a very serious issue, which, which means that we need a very strong uh, monitoring system because one of the things be able to identify people who are doing overfishing and our reported cases is what is monitoring. So government and institutions all over the world, actually we need strong cooperation among governments so that we're able to reduce uh, uh, over what the IUU activities. And one of them is we need strong monetary system. We need a very strong monetary system to be, to be in place so be able to reduce what IUU. For example, let's take a case of uh, the, the eight parties of narrow agreement in the Pacific. So they came out and they have seen that, yeah, there was so a lot of over exploitation going on along their oceans. So what they did was that they have a, a strong monitoring team and they, they revise the fees and the charges by using uh, what they call vessel scheme day. And that one to some extent has been able to reduce uh, illegal and uh, unreported catches because the monetary system makes sure that all those things are, are, are strictly monitored. So which is very, very important. I think we can also replicate it to Africa or other parts of the world. So we make sure that monitoring system is in place so that we can also enforce our laws and standards with strong co cooperation among what intergovernments around the world. Good. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Beck, you want me to ask uh, another Great. question? Yeah, yeah, I think we have time for one more, Rashid. We have time. And actually- There's so many good ones. <laughs> there are many good ones, yeah. So I, I saw this one from, uh, at BC Balogun, uh, and uh, it is about uh, to Ibrahim, how applicable, uh, what you say is interesting, but how applicable are they to multi-species fisheries in the tropics, you know? Yeah, so how do we use the methods you just discussed? So uh, with, uh, I think you are making reference to IUU or or, with you, or even the, pollu the pollutants, right? If you're dealing with tuna or something, we know how it works, but how do you deal with that when you're dealing with sardinella, for example, or those small species? Uh, is it the same problem? Uh, 
Yeah, no, of course, it's not the same problem because some of the fish species are more sensitive to pollution than others. Mm -hmm. So what we are going to do is that, so we need uh, more area specific zones like East Pacific, just like a study that uh, Alava has done with the East Pacific area. You have seen that how climate change interact with uh, pollution and how it has amplified, especially to, or by accumulate into species at a higher level, something like uh, Chinook and salmon and whales, et cetera, it by accumulate. So of, of course, sensitivity to these uh, pollutions is it varies from species to species and from place to place. So we have to make sure that we need more research ongoing to be, go to specific areas and see how they impact and how this in by accumulate into the food web. So for now, it's a self research ongoing and we need to take specific species and see how, they, they, how sensitive they are to pollution. So this is something that uh, we are still conducting and I'm sure by the time that we finish this, our research at a global level, we'll be able to come out with how some of these species are very sensitive to pollution and overfishing and climate change. Okay, thank you. Great, yeah. thanks Ibrahim. I found a couple of others which I think we can combine into one question uh, for Emma, but maybe Erica or Sebastian also have comments. We have about three minutes to do this. So do you think potentially dissolved carbon from resuspended sediment following fishing would be detectable in areas of moderate to high fishing intensity on shallow fishing grounds, e.g. localized acidification and slightly related about spatialized concentration are areas of upwelling also hotspots of, for carbon long-term sequestration or is that not a thing? So I guess it's about that spatial concentration. Um, yeah, so that's really interesting questions. Um, so as for the resuspended, I don't know how localized resuspended would then result in um, ocean acidification. Like that's super interesting. Um, my kind of bias scientific blinkers is very much on the organic side and not really on the ocean acidification, I'm afraid. But certainly when it gets resuspended, it means that um, it might be organic carbon, right, that's buried in sediments. And then the bacteria around there can then dissolve it and turn it back into CO2. And so if it's shallow, then that could re-exchange the atmosphere. And if it's a deep sediment, then it might still remain in the deep ocean, but in a different form. And upwelling regions are really interesting because they're really highly productive. So they could be really high sinks of carbon. Um, and also from work research I've done, we found that um, where there's little oxygen around um, really upwelling systems and lots of productivity, the lack of oxygen means there's not much life living in the deep ocean. So actually a huge amount of carbon does get down, but then also you have upwelling. So the currents are lifting everything up. So then actually, taking the physical oceanography into um into consideration as well makes it all really complicated um sorry a lot of some of my answers are uh to be continued <laughs> um but yeah i'll let someone else if anyone else has something else to add to that okay well we are uh two minutes to closing so i think um we might have to leave it there. Um, but I think actually, Emma, the really exciting thing, as you just suggested about all of this science is that a lot of this is new and it's pioneering. And so actually that's what's exciting about it as well. So I think, um, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's one of the thrilling things about it. So, um, just in terms of the questions that we didn't get to, um, we will write them down, uh, grab them now, and then we'll provide answers on the website afterwards. So we'll harvest the brain's trust and put those on the website at the end of the symposium and we'll share the link with everyone. Or if you just go back to climateocean.com, all of the presentations and the recordings will be there. Um, we just have a very quick poll for everyone to fill in now on your experience and thoughts of the webinar. Um, thank you again to all of the presenters for your excellent presentations and thank you again for everyone for coming. Tomorrow we have a closed workshop with policymakers and managers to discuss how we can turn all of this incredible data into policy and management that delivers change on the ground or water. And then on Thursday, we have our final event, 
which will be a fireside chat or a kind of TV chat show style panel discussion with EU leaders to discuss the political appetite and avenues for harnessing the ocean's power and treating fish and fisheries as the heroes, the climate heroes that they can be. Um, so please remember to register for the upcoming events at climateocean.com. Uh, we'll send links for the presentations and recordings, but at any time, get head to climateocean.com and have a great day, evening, night, <laughs> wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, please fill out the, the poll before you leave if you can. And thanks again to our brilliant superstar scientists and presenters.